This is the United States Energy Association Power Sector Podcast. I'm your host, Herman K. Trabish. I've covered the power sector since 2006, and I currently report for Utility Dive. My guest is Brian Coyman, a principal with business consultant, the Ad Hoc Group, whose focus is power sector policy. In his nearly nine years as a policy and regulatory analyst, Brian has advised some of the most successful U.S. providers of customer-owned resources and smart devices, including Google Nest and Uplight. In this USEA podcast, we're going to talk about those demand-side customer-owned resources, which are projected to provide flexible capacity nearly matching U.S. utility-scale resources by the end of this decade. We're going to talk about the critical policy reforms needed for those resources to leverage federal IRA and infrastructure bill funding to support reliable electricity delivery and help Biden help meet Biden administration climate goals. Brian, let's begin with some basics. What is demand side flexibility and how can customer owned smart devices and distributed energy resources or DER with the needed policy support we're going to discuss in a few minutes, provide flexibility to residential demand response programs? And how can utilities and marketplace aggregators use demand response programs to reward customers who own those resources and to lower all customers' costs and increase power system reliability? Excellent. Well, thanks, Herman. Uh, just want to say first, really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about the subject today. Um, you know, in the past, we've had a lot of guests talking about opportunities and challenges related to the energy transition solutions that we're seeking out. And today, I'm excited to share that perspective as you tee it up from the residential side specifically, which is a, a near and dear passion to me. Um, so exactly. answer your first question. Yeah, answer your first question. Demand side flexibility, what is it? So at, at, at its core, demand side flexibility is anything that a consumer of electricity can do to change the energy usage in response to some kind of signal. I think the key here is it's action taken, as the name suggests, on the demand side, rather than traditional generation-driven supply side. Um, so thinking about demand side flexibility, I really bucket it in two ways. And that harkens all the way back to the first five years of my career when I was at Ohm Connect. Um, so when I was at Ohm Connect, we thought about this as either behavioral or automated. So behavioral demand side flexibility, that's kind of what I would think of as the traditional demand side flexibility, something like an email or a text message where you just ask a customer to take action and sort of cross your fingers and hope that's going to happen. As we've started evolving and as smart technology has become more prevalent, that's been able to move us more into automated demand side flexibility. And this is an area where, you know, as you mentioned, I spent a lot of time uh, working with companies in the space of uh, doing smart panels. Span is one of those companies. You mentioned Nest, induction cooktops with Impulse as well. Um, but I think the core here is that all those technologies uh, are going out into the market, sort of whether ISOs and RTOs and utilities are ready for them or not. And that's what I think is really powerful about the residential sector. Uh, people are making purchasing decisions and they just happen to also be priming their home for future grid flexibility. And that's something that could be a really powerful tool. You know, on top of that, you'd mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act. That's certainly going to be a big catalyst here as well. If you look at in particular, the Homes and Hero programs, those are really going to be geared towards putting out a lot of these different electrification related appliances and technologies uh, into people's homes. But what we need to make sure to do is not just let those stay dormant, right? We need to actually utilize them. Um, and so that gets to the value. And in particular, you'd ask about the value to the utility. I think there's three reasons that demand side flexibility can be so valuable. So for one, uh, just basic math here, a kilowatt not consumed is just as valuable as a kilowatt generated because it all looks the same to the system. But then on top of that, when we think about demand flexibility, particularly, that can help avoid that peak strain because you can target when you're using these different devices or appliances. Um, otherwise, you know, the utility is going to have to just build out uh, more of its system to meet its increasing peak demand. And then finally, which I think this is maybe the most important point, it's also cheaper. Rattle had a report that came out last May that found that aggregated demand side flexibility was actually significantly cheaper than building out a new natural gas power plant or even batteries. So, you know, that all sounds great, right? But I think what we're going to talk about a little bit here is also how do you actually realize that? And the key one here is you actually need to enroll these customers in these programs in the first place. Um, there are already utilities and aggregators doing this, but with the forecasted growth, we still have a long ways to go here. Right. Okay. Uh, your specialty is policy. So I want to start with some uh, important policy questions here. The first one is that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, Order 2222 it was a big deal when it was uh, ordered, 
And uh, it was intended to transform the potential of demand side flexibility into an energy market resource. But in many parts of the country, that hasn't happened. I heard a solar advocate the other day call uh, Order 2222 a nothing burger. Many advocates are talking about alternatives like distribution level programs or local flexi flexibility markets, excuse me. Um, can you explain that order a little more and and where it is being implemented and where and why it is not being implemented? And and and, and can FERC do something about that? Sure. Um, well, I appreciate the perspective uh, from the person you talked to. I wouldn't go so far as to call it nothing <laughs> burger necessarily, uh, but I do think we have a ways to go here. Um, so just first, you know, for those that don't know what is Order 2222, uh, as it was issued all the way back in 2020. What it was supposed to do is really open up all regulated electricity markets to allow DERs to provide the kind of demand flexibility we were just talking about. And the key there is to get paid for doing so. Um, so right off the bat, right. you know, it doesn't actually impact everybody, right? Only two thirds of us in the US roughly are living uh, under markets that are regulated by FERC. Um, so it will help a majority of customers, but but it won't impact all the customers. So that's just you know one baseline thing right there. Um, and in particular, mm -hmm. I think one of the other challenges around Order 2222, and this is where I understand some of the angst uh, out there in the market, is that progress on it, on the actual implementation of it, has been pretty slow in some areas. Um, so for yeah. example, just looking at how ISOs and RTOs have replied to FERC, uh, MISO, for example, proposed a 2030 timeframe. And I think what's particularly right. challenging for people in the space that look at this is that on you know, on the other hand, you have Kaiso. Uh, they had systems in place back in 2016 or, or even earlier to support effectively the same kinds of processes. So, you know, again, for those that don't, uh, that's California, and that that's in California. Yes. Um, so, yeah. you know, one of the core issues there is that there's a lot of IT systems systems investment that needs to happen at these ISOs and RTOs. Just thinking about uh, why that's the case, you know, historically, the ISOs and the RTOs are serving loads at the feeder or even higher up on the distribution system. And that's the most granular they have to get to. Now, we're talking about feeding, uh, we're, we're talking about serving individual appliances, uh, individual households. And that's just an order of magnitude change in the complexity of their systems. Um, you know, on the flip side, recognizing that there's those challenges, delaying can be a real problem here. Uh, Wood McKenzie does an annual DER review, and it's projecting 260 gigawatts by 2027 of DERs. Uh, Brattle, the same report that we mentioned, uh, also is projecting large DER increases by 2030, including 34% of homes having smart thermostats. 83 gigawatts of residential rooftop solar, 27 gigawatts of behind the meter batteries. We haven't really talked about EVs yet, but you know, 26 million EVs on the road is also going to be a seismic change in how yeah. uh, customers are using yeah. it. So to answer your last question, what can FERC do about it? You know, so far what we're seeing is that FERC is so, uh, has been generally accepting ISO and RTO requests delay, although they are withholding judgment on the extreme MISO timeline that we talked through. Um, you know, I think overall, uh, and I believe a lot of people recognize this. There, there is an urgency here, just given the needs of the grid and the desires of the customer. Like the, what's underpinning all this is that IRA-driven purchasing hasn't even started yet, but customers are still purchasing these devices anyway. So we can only expect this to snowball over the next decade. Yeah. Um, the, so what you're describing is sort of a process. Um, California is ahead of the curve. And the Midwest, which is what MISO serves, is behind the curve. Uh, but there is a process going on. It's just not happening fast enough to get this uh, customer-owned flexibility market moving right away. Um, a big part of the problem with current rules <clears throat> that the ISOs and RTOs need to address is uh, uh, compensating flexibility. And the markets and utilities want customer-owned resources to conform to practices designed for utility-scale resources. But the data necessary for market compensation is a normal part of large resource operations, while utilities don't often make that data available to their residential customers. So there's, there's a lot of discussion about the importance of data and why it's an obstacle to putting demand-side flexibility to work. And, and that means compensating demand side flexibility. So tell us about that, that data issue and how the obstacle can be removed. 
Yeah, the requirements to data is definitely one of the areas where, especially on the residential side, there is a challenge and a gap there in meeting right now what the ISOs and RTOs would like to see. Um, and so taking a step back, just looking at the order 2222 compliance, uh, the compliance filings, there's sort of this difference in my mind between being technically compliant and functionally compliant. And what FERC cares about is technically compliant. Did the did the filings by the ISOs and RTOs, are their plans meeting what Order 2222 required them to do? Um, so you could check the box there, but then as you drill in a little bit more, there start cropping up some things that are more so functional compliant challenges. And what I think a lot of that harkens back to is that it makes a lot of sense. ISOs and RTOs have this tendency to, by default, want to treat everything like a generator because that's what they're accustomed to. Um, you know, we right. talked about the IT system investment. It's going to be easiest for them if they could treat everything like a generator because their systems are already set up to do that. But unfortunately, and again, specifically on the residential side, not everything can be treated like a generator. So for one, a generator sits in one location versus in the paradigm we're talking about now, you have these DER spread across households, across neighborhoods, across cities. Um, so as ISOs and RTOs set rules around potentially limiting geographic pools, treating it as if it was just sitting in one location, that starts to fall apart when you think about just how distributed everything is. Um, it also becomes more challenging when ISOs and RTOs think about things like setting minimum aggregation sizes, saying you have to have, say, you know, uh, 10 kilowatts in order to participate in the market, which can work if you have have the right devices if you have a storage uh, or an EV at home, but doesn't work as well for those that have smart thermostats uh, because they just the, the house is not bringing on that much load. Um, and then, of course, to the point that you brought up, there's data. Uh, and in particular, we're seeing ISOs and RTOs be really interested in getting even up to the second meter data from these individual DERs. The reality, though, unfortunately, is that that's not what these can actually provide. And so what I'd love to see is sort of a a meeting halfway here, relaxing requirements on data access to not say we need to see meter level data uh, or um, metering data, but instead using the device, using the data the device can actually give you. So if it's, a, again, a smart thermostat as an example, just look at when it turned on and look at when it turned off. And you can use that as an estimation to understand this is what the device was able to provide. And then I think the second way that we can overcome some of these data challenges is to also make it easier to access customer meter data. Um, now, ultimately, that's not a FERC issue. Right. That's going to be a state public utility commission issue. Um, there are some that are contemplating this right now, but I think for many others, this is not even you know, close to the top of the priority list. Um, so in absence of that, you know, there's also companies out there that we know that are working with utilities to understand what are other approaches to disseminate meter data. Um, Copper Labs looks at the meter directly and says, how can we, you know, access the, the data that's there and turn it into smart meter data. Uh, utility API works with utilities as, in a partnership to be able to share meter data that way. And those are really good tools to enable in this kind of interim period, these aggregators to still be able to do something in the market, even if it's not that, you know, revenue quality meter data that you might need to have everywhere. Right, and, and, and but the, and the process goes on toward having the, the best data. Uh, it's it's not impossible to get it. Like you say, the, there can be access to the meter data, uh, but it, it, it's, it, it's part of that complication that all the utilities at, at, at the distribution system level and uh, the, uh, system operators at the transmission system level have to adjust to, and it's part of that process of adjusting that you described earlier. This debate about equal access to demand response programs by utilities and non-utility operated DER ag aggregations, which are sometimes called virtual power plants, uh, goes on. Uh, and you described in something you wrote a factor called the opt-out that enables state regulators to restrict demand response programs only to utilities. Now, FERC initially removed that opt-out, but then it reversed itself and left the decision to state regulators. What are non-utility aggregators and why should regulators include them in demand response programs yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this in part because I actually happen to live in one of these dozen opt-out states. I'm in Minnesota, which is one of the states right now where you cannot participate with a third-party aggregator. I think ultimately, uh, when you look at the, the system as a whole and all the growth that's going to happen, the continued ex existence of the opt-out ends up uh, threatening the ability to get more cheap demand flexibility on the grid. Um, there's going to be this continued growth of DERs through mechanisms like the IRA, and it's going to happen, whether the grid wants it to or not, whether the ISOs and RTOs are prepared for it or not. Uh, and so in the absence of demand flexibility, 
you just have these DERs that are going out there and adding demand, which in turn would otherwise necessitate the costly build out of other power plants. Um, so you had Jen Downing on your podcast recently, Herman, who talked about the DOE VPP liftoff report. That report found that by 2030, the U.S. is going to need 200 gigawatts of peak capacity. Um, and mm -hmm. on top of that peak capacity need, shortfalls are still an issue too. So last year, MISO projected a future capacity shortfall that could hit as the as early as the summer of 2025, a 2.1 gigawatt shortfall. So that's all to sum up to say, we need demand, uh, or we need, we need a way to serve demand, and we need a way to do that really quickly. And the best way to do that would be to take these existing resources, these existing DERs, and aggregate them together. It's much, much faster than having to build out actual traditional power plants. Um, now, in terms of you know how that interplays with the opt-out, I think that those that are supportive of the opt-out and um, others might be tempted to say, well, we've seen in other areas where utilities are successful in doing these programs, so this should all come from the utility. And again, I'm, I don't want to discount those. Utilities have certainly had successful programs, but I think it's also fair to say that not every utility is the same. Um, and in fact, uh, there's also been uh, historic evidence to suggest that when you open up these markets and you allow aggregators and utilities to compete against each other, it actually ends up being to the benefit of the customers on the on the grid. Um, so in California, going back there, uh, California in 2016 opened up that market and allowed third party aggregators to directly compete against utility programs. And when they did that, there was a concern that this might end up in some sense cannibalizing the existing utility programs and all it would be doing is shifting customers into these new programs. And in fact, the opposite ended up, uh, ended up being the case. Uh, a report that came out a couple of years after they opened up that market found that 95% of the customers that participated with a third party aggregator had never actually participated in a demand flexibility program before. So that's tremendous tremendously important, right? Because that shows that aggregators aren't just going out and finding existing customers and bringing them into their programs instead. They are actually uncovering customers that otherwise wouldn't be doing anything at all. So all you are really doing by opening up to competition is adding the overall level of capacity that can now be provided by the demand side resources. Right. It's putting the, the competitive market uh, advantages to work. Um, we have very little time to answer a very big question, Brian, but I'm going to throw this at you, and I'd love a, a short answer if you could come up with one. Um, there is doubt among people that have been in the power sector a long time that the owners of all these uh, DER and uh, other devices that are coming onto the power system will enroll them in demand response programs, either with private or, or utility aggregators. Uh, to support this reliability that they could provide. Um, will they allow the resources to be used when demand spikes make those resources urgently needed both by customer owners and the system? Just a few minutes if possible. Yeah, and I think what's really important here is everyone buying into a vision. And to me, I think that vision should be that everyone with a DER is enrolled in demand flexibility program. So, you know, to get there, the first thing you have to do is actually have those programs in existence first. If there's no program, there's nothing to enroll into. But then to answer your question as well as, you know, do customers actually want this? I, I think so. I think they really do. Uh, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is that alongside all this growth in electricity demand is also rising bill costs. Um, that same DOE report said that one in six American households are now behind on electric bills. Um, and so enrolling your technology in demand, flexi in demand flexibility programs means you're getting paid to have your technology be used during events. That's money that can go right back into the customer's pocket and start offsetting some of these rising bills. Um, and you know, on top of it, demand flexibility then helps to mitigate the broader system costs of meeting peak demand. So in the long run, it also drives right. down the overall electricity cost, which is just going to be good for everybody, good for the grid, good for affordability to stand up more of these programs. How do we get there? Right. You know, I think there's a couple ways. One, it'd be great to expedite Order 2222 implementation and program development, get that off the ground as fast as possible. Again, that could be two thirds of the US or more participating demand flexibility programs through that. I think the other thing is to try to leverage all the channels where customers are buying these smart devices to, today. So so for example, if a customer goes and buys a smart thermostat on a utility website, they have the opportunity to pre-enroll that into a utility program. And that can be a really powerful tool at the point of purchase to say to the customer, here's a way where you can get a little more money and it's also really beneficial to the whole system. The other place where we'd want to think more about this pre-enroll concept is directly on IRA deployment. As customers are using these IRA incentives to purchase these 
future smart devices, why don't we go ahead and at the point of installation, enroll those customers into programs as well. Um, so then you're not just putting electrification out there, you're putting smart electrification out there. Uh, and that can really help to bridge that gap that we're seeing right now in what peak demand will look like and what's uh, supply for that peak demand is going to look like. Right, and those things are all evolving. You're seeing some things turn up at uh, various uh, retail uh, box stores and things. But it's, as you have mentioned a couple of times, we have mentioned a couple of times, actually, uh, this is all an evolving process to bring this whole new set of resources that can save everybody money once we get used to them into the system. But that's all we have time for, uh, Brian. So I, I want to thank you, uh, Ad Hoc Group Principal Brian Coyman, for your insights into the regulatory reforms and other solutions needed to allow customer-owned resources to improve reliable electricity delivery, lower customer bills, and help meet decarbonization goals. And as always, I also want to thank our listeners for taking the time to check out the USEA Power Sector Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share with everybody you know our quest for energy transition solutions.